Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Joining us today is Professor Helga Wodeman, who will be giving us a talk on soft robotics and AI. We will also be introducing a project at the end of the, of the talk, so do stick around for that. I'll be giving a brief introduction about Professor Helga. Professor Helga is a roboticist and associate professor of robotics at UCL. He leads the soft robotics and soft haptics and robotics lab, which currently consists of 14 researchers who have become well established within their fields of research at top universities. His research interest emphasizes on the hardware design and application of soft material robotic systems that have the ability to change their shape and stiffness on demand. The three subjects that he focuses on are tools for minimally invasive interventions, robots for industrial applications, and soft, stiffness controllable and shape changing driving seats for autonomous vehicles. Professor Helger has authored or co authored over 100 papers published in high impact journals leading the field of robotics and peer reviewed full length conference papers presented at premium robotics conferences. He has been invited to deliver talks at the launch of the soft robotics program by the German Research Foundation, the International Congress of the Society for Medical Innovation and Technology, the Digital Catapult, and at many highly ranked universities. He has also been the organizer or co-organizer of many conferences, workshops, and symposia, such as the workshops at ICRA, IROS, and the Hamlin Symposium on Medical Robotics, to name a few. On, uh, furthermore, Professor Help will be the co-general chair of the 2023 IEEE International Conference on Robotics and Automation that is expecting more than 4,500 roboticists from around the world. As you can see, Professor Helga Werderman is an outstanding roboticist, and I'm sure there are many positives we can learn from today's session with him. Without further ado, let us welcome Professor Helg to share his work with us. So first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and for the kind introduction. Uh, that's very kind of you. Um, and I, I find it uh, very, very well organized and very um, nice that also junior and I think also senior um, students are engaged in these activities, which are very important to bring people together, not only because of the same interest in the field, of artificial intelligence, but also that there is an interaction socially between all of you. So let's, let's start. Um, it was already mentioned. I hope you can all see my screen. Um, I, I just need to stop sharing my screen and share it again because I would like to also share my, I'm sorry, one button, share my audio. Um, that might be helpful in some of the slides that I'm showing. So I'm Associate Professor of Robotics in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And you might already assume that most of my work are in mechanical engineering uh, in terms of robotics, rather than the um, computational or computer science aspects. So I'm talking there about artificial intelligence. However, we have in our lab also applied AI. We have not developed AI algorithms, but we have made use of available AI algorithms such as neural networks um, that can be done through MATLAB toolboxes, as you might know, or using platforms like TensorFlow. Um, first of all, let me just mention that please just unmute and ask your questions whenever you think you have a question. Um, I'm very flexible and the more interaction there is, the easier it is for everyone and the more fun it is for everyone. But of course, if you like to keep your questions until the end, please ask your question at the end. I hope I will um, give everyone, allow everyone to have uh, time to ask their question. Yep, we will yep. have a Q&A session at the end. Fantastic. Um, so you can see three blocks here. So the team that I'm leading at uh, UCL is called the UCL Soft Haptics and Robotics Team. And we do application-driven 
um, research in soft robotics and AI. Um, on the one side, we are concentrating on healthcare engineering, and there we're looking into robotic assisted minimally invasive surgery, but also interventions, phantom development, and we develop haptic devices for upper limb prostheses. Then we have another very interesting area um, on collaborative robots. So these are robots that work closely together with humans in a safe way. And the last one that is very maybe recent, so for two or three years, I'm looking now into providing, um, providing drivers in highly automated vehicles with haptic feedback through a soft, if you want stiffness controllable driver seat. So let's dive in into each of these application areas and look closer um, on the work that we are doing in our lab. So when we come to healthcare engineering, there are three different topics. So I'm looking there into minimally invasive surgery, which is most of the times robotically assisted, then cardiovascular interventions. Um, and that is in fact a very strong um, research area in mechanical engineering. Many of my colleagues are looking at different aspects of cardiovascular or vascular interventions. And then we also develop patient-specific modular aortic vascular phantoms that have, in fact, clinical, uh, relevant clinical mechanical properties. I would like to give you a short overview of the work that I have been doing with my team in robotic-assisted minimally invasive surgery. So here you can see a landscape um, of companies that have emerged in the field um, of surgical um, interventions and which are robotic and um, split up into different groups. So on the very left hand side you see single port and multi-port surgery. So this is when uh, a small incision is made into the for instance abdominal area and then instruments are inserted and um, through these small incisions um, and you can see it's it's fairly crowded. The space is very crowded. Then we have vascular robots and they are not so many, as you can see, there are also some of them are more working on how can we merge different sensing modalities, imaging modalities, and make this uh, better presentable to the surgeon or to the um, cardiologist. Then we have a few in neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery as well. So you can see on the very left hand side, we have a number of these companies, some of them have just announced that they will launch their uh, robotic system. But there is in general a common architecture between all of them. And let's dive in into some of them and look how these current surgical robotic systems are working. Let me start with one of the gold standards of surgical robotics, the Da Vinci system from Intuitive Surgical, a US company. So the Architecture is a master-slave um, configuration. And here you can see, I'm sorry about this. Here you can see, in fact, the, um, the slave side. So the slave side has a number of um, arms. And on each of these arms, there is a rigid, um, straight rigid laparoscopic tool mounted which of course is robotically actuated so you can see here the tip of one of these arms will hold a camera so that the surgeon can look through this camera and then navigate the arms to the point of interest where the operation should happen so here you can now see in a second the master side and the master side is a console that will come up in a second um, is a console and the surgeon will usually sit on the console and look through with the head through these binoculars and look then through the camera of the slave side and then use these um, this console which is really mimicking the um, the maneuverability and dexterity of your risk and, and then navigate the 
um, laparoscopic instruments on the slave side. So now you can see here each side of the console and each side of the console is then maneuvering um, one of the arms so you can um, simultaneously move two arms at the same time of course you have pedals at the bottom and the pedals let you then switch between the different arms so you can also use these two remaining arms. Most of the surgical robots that are available so now my computer is struggling I think a little bit with the video but most of the surgical robots are using a similar architecture. So there's always this teleoperation where you have a master slave configuration and the surgeon or clinician is sitting on the, on the master side using an input device to navigate robots on the slave side. So here you can see another setup, again, multiple arms. Um, so each arm is here, um, mounted on a separate platform so you can move them individually if you remember the da vinci one had one big trunk where multiple arms um, were mounted on and here you have a system where you have each arm being mounted onto a separate i'm very sorry about this my i tried to show you with my mouse um, and stop at the right moment of these um, so you could see here, for instance, you again have a master slave side. So the, on the slave side, you have multiple robots. Each robot is mounted on a single platform. But again, each instrument, each robot is holding an instrument, which is straight going through a small incision here into the abdominal. And this is a phantom, of course, into the abdominal area. And in this case, the clinician on the left-hand side is sitting upright in an upright position, he or she doesn't need to hold the, um, doesn't need to look through a binocular um, system, but wears 3D glasses and a standard 3D screen to then look through the endoscopic camera here. Of course, there are many other surgical um, robots in general. What they have literally in common is also that they are using laparoscopic instruments which are straight and rigid. They're made usually out of a metal-like material that are then inserted into through these stroker ports, as you can see here. And then they are navigated, pushing away sometimes some organs or repositioning some of these stroker ports in order to reach um, the soft tissue that needs to be removed, for instance. So these, this, these have disadvantages as when you look at this because these are straight tools. If you want to um, change your location, for instance, you usually have to make another incision from another area in order to reach this location. So in order to overcome some of these challenging, challenges when using rigid and uh, straight instruments, we have been looking into soft stiffness controllable robots. And you can see from the picture here that we have looked into the octopus and the octopus arms to propose on the one side silicon-based pneumatically actuated manipulators, but also looked into pneumatic and tenon-driven actuation that are based on an antagonistic principle. And the reason why we have looked into the octopus as a role model is not to, to literally copy the internal structure of one of these arms, but look more into the functionality that each of these arms um, have in terms of squeezability, stiffness controllability, navigation, etc., and try to take these functionalities and implement them into a robotic device. Our application in this case was something called TME. It's called total mesorectal excision, which is an, an application that has been um, suggested by our clinical expert, Professor Alberto Arezzo from the University of Turin. He is a general surgeon specialized on colorectal surgery, having used these surgical instruments for quite a long time in his career. And 
the operation looks into removing tumorous tissue located here in the rectum and then essentially suturing back the both healthy parts of the colon. When you look at the operation, this operation usually starts at the top left here, where the surgeon has to separate the surrounding tissue from the colon, also in this descending um, rectum or, or uh, colon, in order to then pull the colon down, because as you can imagine, there is some length of the colon removed, which is cancerous. So those of you who cannot see any patient pictures, please don't look onto your um, screens now because I show you um, a couple of um, pictures from an operation. So here you can see the location positioning of the troca port. So the troca ports are these small incisions here and then a kind of device is uh, moved through this in order to allow an instrument to be inserted. So these are called trocars. And you can see for this operation, you have usually four trocars. One is at, for instance, at, uh, at location A. This is usually the camera, the laparoscopic camera. And then you have also, um, for example, D and F, and another one for a laparoscopic assistant. And you can see that the workspace that the surgeon has to reach within this operation is quite uh, large. So he has to, or she, the clinician has to operate on the top left, go all the way to the right, and then go down at the colon uh, to the south here in order to remove the cancerous tissue. And in some cases, that also means that tools need to be repositioned. So you have to make an additional troca port, but in some cases, it also means that the instruments that the surgeon is holding and operating with are crossed over. So it's very challenging, especially in this uh, part, which is of paramount important, importance, because this is essentially resulting in removing the colon that contains the tumorous tissue it becomes extremely challenging for the surgeon. And there's a long list of procedural steps. And in fact, we identified this procedural steps step as one of the ones that we want to replicate using a soft stiffness controllable manipulator. So you can see here a computer aided design illustration of the first prototype that we aimed to build. It is made out of three sections or components here. Each component, as you can see on the um, right-hand side, is made out of a cylindrical body that is made out of a silicon type of material. And inside this silicon cylinder, there are a number of cavities embedded. These are empty cavities. Um, the cross-section of these cavities vary or can vary. You can design them in a different shape. And you can then pressurize this um, silicon body. And by pressurizing, of course, the entire cavity will inflate and you will have a resulting bending. So here you can see some uh, demonstration. So if you actuate one cavity, you can see here some in inflation. Um, this inflation will then result in a bending behavior. And if you actuate one or two, this will result, as I mentioned, in a bending behavior. Or if you simultaneously actuate all of them at the same time, it can also result in an elongation. In order to prevent this ballooning effect in the axial direction, uh, we were looking into different braided sheaths that prevent, in a way, and you can see it in the video here, the gray kind of sheath that prevents this axial deformation and only results in an elongation. Um, so it's a little bit more controllable. So eventually we uh, used pneumatic air actuation to actuate one of these modules. And we um, built a series of these uh, segments um, so that we eventually have a multiple degrees of freedom. 
Another aspect at this time was to model the entire robot, of course, uh, using analytical models. But there was also the um, aim to use sensing uh, systems and embed these within the soft silicon um, body. And you can imagine that this, this um, kind of ballooning effect that we experienced with our design was giving us a few challenges. Um, it gave us challenges in terms of modeling um, and especially when it came into interaction with multiple chambers that are interact uh, that are inflated, uh, but also interactions between the graded sheet that is outside this, multi, uh, this um, silicon body, but also when it came to interaction with any sensors that we embedded into the robot. So for instance, we used... Um, uh, we used electroconductive yarn to measure the length of the silicon body. We used um, also uh, fibers um, to transmit light. And then we looked into the intensity the, of the light and the light change to measure uh, the, the length of the uh, module. And you can imagine that, of course, if we have some inflation process happening, that these sensing equipment will be influenced and the entire reading would be false or at least not return what we expect to return. So we looked into further developing uh, the mechanical design of our soft manipulator and resulted essentially in a miniaturized segment. And this miniaturized segment has a... Uh, is, uh, has a diameter of about 15 millimeters. It was about a third of the diameter of the previous um, uh, of the previous prototype. And in this case, we have also multiple um, chamber air uh, chamber pairs that can be again pressurized pneumatically or hydraulically using water, for instance. And each of these chambers. They were braided as well. There was a thread that was going um, that was um, essentially embedded um, around each of these chambers. And this thread prevented any axial deformation of the pressurized chamber, only resulting in elongation. So you can. Um, Imagine that, of course, that helped us to integrate further equipment quite significantly. On the other side, we also looked into then modeling these uh, soft manipulators. And there we started with looking more into um, analytical models. And these analytical models are very uh, much inspired by um, by beam theory, by the beam theory. And I, I'm sure that some of you who are in mechanical engineering um, know of this theory. One of them is the Euler-Bernoulli um, um, Euler model. And in this case, what we have actually done is, so when, you, when, you, when we talk about the, the beam theory, you usually have a long beam, and then you apply a force at the tip of the beam, and you can understand the deformation when you apply a certain force. So what we have done is we have separated the entire um, manipulator into um, discrete segments. Here, you can see one of them in gray. And we have calculated the deformation that is applied by the internal pressure that is acting on on the soft manipulator due to the pneumatic air pressure, for instance, on each of these sections, and then calculated the deformation for each of these cross sections. And then what we've done at the end is to literally sum up, so this is done by this integral here, sum up each of these cross sections and the deformation of these displacements of these cross sections to identify the overall position of the tip. What we have also looked into is 
elastic, elastic and hyper elastic models because they are not only internal um, internal forces acting onto a manipulator there might be also when it comes to surgery external um, forces that act onto a manipulator that also have an effect on the an overall configuration as you can see here for instance if if you see this is a force sensor here and the forces are applied along the axis of the manipulator and you can see how the shape is changing also when it's bending of course and in order to incorporate them uh, we developed these for example uh, neo hokian model we also looked into a very interesting thing that is maybe very specific for soft robotic devices uh, here we looked into stiffness controllability so on the one side you have these soft robots and on the other side you have these laparoscopic tools that are made out of metal usually and you can kind of tell uh, based on geometry um, easily where the tip of the where the tip of this laparoscopic tool is and then of course you can apply forces onto the environment and usually you know when you interact with soft tissue your laparoscopic tool would not break and you can exert forces quite high forces through manipulating tissue with a rigid laparoscopic tool but when you have a soft robot this soft robot of course will deform when interacting with the environment and so we, what we understood through our work here is how does do we need to actuate the soft robot and how does a soft robot need to exert in which direction need a soft ro need a soft robot to exert forces onto the environment in order to have a stable but a very high stiffness at the tip so we looked here into taking inspiration from uh, linear uh, rigid industrial robots where the kinematics is um, derived using um, using motions screw motions so this is based on screw theory and then we um, modeled our continuous robot with a discrete number of in this case upu joints and then we did the analysis called in this case uh, the davis method to understand the stiffness capability at the tip of the manipulator and of course then in the end we all have to build this robot and this is our first miniaturized prototype. You can see two segments here. There is an endoscopic camera, USB camera inserted into the internal channel. You can see also nice here, the pneumatic pipes that supply pressure to the tip. And you can see now how the entire manipulator elongates when you pressurize all of these chambers. I have to warn everyone now because I will show some um, videos of human cadavers. It's not this one, this is a phantom, but the next slide will contain some human cadaver uh, video material because we have built a second prototype where we nicely integrated all of these chambers, these pipes into the base segment. There's again a USB endoscopic camera through the working channel inside the soft robot. And then we have demonstrated these procedural step of a total mesorectal excision that I explained earlier on in a cadaver, human cadaver test. And this is on the left-hand side, Professor Alberto Arezzo, who is assisted by, uh, by his colleague, uh, Joaf, and they are performing here some of these procedural steps. And you can see how the manipulator was then used inside the um, inside the abdominal area so you can see the camera view here and you can actually see how the camera can be navigated and nicely bending around some of these organs I understand the video is quite slow so now you I hope it didn't crash can you still hear me yes sorry it was just stuck So 
that, that's our work on some of our work on robotic assisted minimally invasive surgery and there's a lot more if you're interested in this topic um, we also do cardiovascular surgery and as i mentioned we develop prosthetic or haptics for prosthesis so please have a look onto our website um, or just get in touch if you're interested in more our second topic that we're interested in and i'm um to, which I'm talking about now is collaborative robots. And there we have looked into robots, and they are sometimes called cobots, that can work closely together with the human. So probably you have seen this, uh, these videos, you know, where industrial robots, which I would call traditional robotic devices that are working um, on these assembly lanes, and each of these robots understands a surgeon procedure that needs to be executed. And if a human enters the cage that a robot is inside, the robot comes to a still stand, should not execute anything anymore because the robot can only execute pre-programmed trajectories and tasks. However, there are a number of tasks that could benefit from a human robot collaboration. So for instance, if you want to assembly uh, certain parts and the human has to be somehow kept in, in the loop, um, certain manufacturing or assembly tasks would benefit from a very close human robot interaction. And there have been a number of robotic devices, one of the examples is here, that are aiming to guarantee a safe human robot interaction. And how they have done it is to give the capability to these robotic devices to understand the environment. How do robots understand the environment? How do human, humans um, understand the environment? Of course, we have to integrate some sensing devices. So on the one side, robotics is of course the mechanical engineering perspective, so the physical body of a robot, then you have the ability to sense the environment, right? And then you have the artificial brain or the artificial intelligence that is looking at all of this data and giving certain commands to the actuators of the physical body to then respond accordingly. And so this is kind of the second part of robotics where people have looked into different type of sensors, for instance, force torque sensors that measure, for example, the currents inside these um, motors, inside these joints. And when there is a physical interaction with the environment, there will be a spike or there will be an increase of this current. And then the robot can adjust the stiffness of the joints or the actuators to give them more compliance and a safer interaction with these robots, uh, with, with humans. This is, not, of course, not the only way of making these collaborative robots. They are, first of all, these collaborative robots are lower in we weight. They have also a lower um, um, uh, loading um, at the end effector, so they can maybe only uh, pick up um, three to five kilograms. And in fact, there are also other sensing technologies such as vision from the top, where you can understand the robotic, uh, the workspace of the robot to understand where the human is and how the human moves inside the workspace to then react accordingly. If you look into the market, there have been many of these proposed. One quite famous is the KUKA um, robot, but it's not the only um, robotic device that is on the market looking into um, how robots can work in a safe way um, with a human uh, worker. But there have been also other companies and other ways. So you can see this one is again, a robot that is made out of uh, mechanical uh, or, um, metal, uh, a metal body, and then there are electromagnetic 
drives inside the joints that can then uh, change the position of each of these arms. But there have been also other um, systems proposed. This is a system proposed by Festo, where they, of course, have also links that are rigid. So each link is between the, uh, the joints. But they have been looking into um, developing variable stiffness controllable actuators based on pneumatics. So you can see here, the actuator that is driving each of these arms has actually multiple cavities. And based on the pressure inside these multiple cavities, you can ad um, adjust the stiffness of these, um, um, of these um, actuators. And in, in fact, if you look into how humans do it, or how the ac muscle activity works in an octopus, you will find that there are pairs of muscles that oppose each other. One is demonstrated here. So there are two sets of muscles that oppose each other and gives the ability, for example, to the octopus or in this case to the human to control the stiffness of the joint. This is also referred to antagonistic behavior. So when you look into variable stiffness joints, as I showed earlier on, it is possible to change the overall compliance and adjust it accordingly. But we really have to look into um, variable stiffness links in order to be able to adjust local stiffness. And that's what we have done in one of these projects. So we have looked into soft stiffness controllable um, links. Here you can see one of the uh, cat drawings of one of our links that is made out of a layer of textile fabric material and silicon material. And we have, if you um, now pressurize each of these links, you can change the stiffness of these links. So here's a short video uh, where uh, this effect is demonstrated. So we have two links here. The air pressure is on. So both of these are very similar to a bicycle or car tire. These are very rigid. And then we have um, integrated um, off-the-shelf uh, motors, servo motors. So when you, you can now see when the pressure is lowered, the stiffness is lowered. So this is because of the own um, gravity of the, uh, the weight of each of these arms. So you can see that in all directions, essentially, there's the ability to change the stiffness of the joints. So this is um, a system that we have built a few years back now, and we have, of course, advanced it. So we have also looked into very similar, uh, very much in analogy to uh, motors that have a current sensor in there and can measure how much torque is actually exerted to the environment, we have integrated into our system some pressure sensors. Of course, each of these pressure regulators that would feed pressure into each of these links have a closed loop system with a pressure sensor monitoring the pressure. But we have implemented additional pressure sensors so that we can read, in fact, the, and monitor the pressure. And you can imagine if you now have a load onto the end effector. So if you pull onto the end effector, or you're going to bounce against one of these links, you can imagine that for a short time, the pressure inside one of these um, links will go up, as you can see here. So this is a simple program behind this. The robotic arm is going from left to right, and then at one point there will be a physical interaction with the human, and then the sensor will um, monitor the pressure, and at one point the, there will be a spike in the pressure so that the robot will understand that there was a physical interaction with the human, and the reaction will be then that the uh, robot will stop and go to the default position. So this is a way to embed also some sensors inside these 
um, collaborative robots in order to detect any physical interaction and avoid collisions, in fact. In another uh, prototype, we have actually advanced our system um, and built the system that you can see on the left-hand side. So we have built here on the right-hand side, top right, you can see that we've built a modular, more modular system where you essentially can have as many of these links as you like. You can connect them to, in this case, uh, uh, servo motors that also have torque measurement. And you can put them in series and then connect each of these um, links to a pressure regulator and you can, um, you can actuate them and change the stiffness. What we've also done is, what you can see here is, we have developed a 3D printed link and the 3D printed link is very rigid, as you can imagine. So it would not have any, it would not bend at all or deflect when there's any force acting on one of these ends. And what we have done then is we have developed an open loop controller. So here you can see, first of all, we have modeled this um, uh, using forward kinematics. And we have um, measured, in fact, not only the pressure inside of these variable stiffness links, but what we have also measured is um, the location at the tip. So you can see it maybe here, there at the end effector, we have an aurora marker, and this aurora marker will give us the position. And we have recorded um, the position of the end effector based on the pressure inside these variable stiffness links, um, uh, variable stiffness links, as well as considered different um, weights at the tip of the uh, robot. And then we programmed some trajectories that the robot should go along and we recorded this into our neural network. So here you can see, for instance, it, they are, this is the trajectory, so it's two curved trajectories in this case. And um, in red, you can see here, this is the trajectory that we calculated based on, or that we returned based on rigid links. So when we had these 3D printed modular links, then in blue, this is the trajectory that is based on our model, plus the information from the servo motors. And then in fact, the remaining um, colors are the actual positions measured by the uh, sensor at the tip with different, um, with different, and you can see here, different um, pressure inside the variable stiffness links. And for one case, we didn't have any load at the end effector, and then we increased the load, I think, up to 75 or 100 grams. And you can see that, in fact, the difference between our model and the actual position will increase the more load there is and the less pressure there is in the links. So we have built our neural network and informed our open loop position control um, of this information that, you know, when you increase the load and decrease the pressure, that there will be an increasing error in the position that is achieved. And you can see here in this graph, in fact, in blue is the ground truth, yeah? And in green, there is the model-based um, the model, the model kinematics. And you can see between the blue and the green, there's a big offset and a big arrow. But if we now implement our neural network-based hybrid model, that's how we called it, we can increase the accuracy of our um, position controller. So this is an example. We have done a lot of experiments with this type of robot, and we're looking always into improving um, our position controller using and applying um, AI, as in this case, we use neural networks. So now I'm coming to the last and final um, area where I want to introduce the work that we are doing in highly automated vehicles and how we inform drivers, in fact, when it comes to changes of autonomy levels. You might have heard that 
I'm, I'm 100% sure you're all sitting in the artificial intelligence a society that we are going towards fully autonomous cars, driverless cars that will drive us around. And in fact, a hundred years ago, there were the first experiments happening with these autonomous vehicles. Around the 1950s, as you can see here, there was a video published um, and a vehicle, a prototype published by GM, which is called the Firebird. And it's in fact a turbine driven uh, vehicle. And I want to show you this vehicle in the next video, and I hope you can all see and hear. So this is in 1956. Roger Firebird 2, moved to electronic control strip in center lane. Synchronize your speed and direction. Check. Attune speed first. Yes, I think my video is struggling a little bit, so I explain a little well bit. Well done, Firebird 2. You're now under automatic control. Hands off steering. So what has happened here, and I appreciate that the transmission was not as good as I thought, but there is a gentleman in the tower, and this person in the tower informed the driver of this car how to go from a lower autonomy level where the driver has to drive himself to a higher autonomy level where you give the control to the vehicle. And this is done in a very intuitive way for the driver. Just imagine as if the person in the tower is kind of the artificial intelligence of the vehicle, right? So now we, when we look at the different autonomy levels that are um, that are classified by the SAA, SAE, we will see that, of course, on the left-hand side, we have level zero, where you have to drive. How boring is that? And on the other side, you have no driver needed anymore, so fully or driverless vehicles. And, of course, there is some room in between, where there it's not very clear, or it is very clear, but there is some interaction required from the human. These autonomy levels, in fact, are defined by the technology that is integrated into these vehicles. So for instance, if you have level one autonomy, you usually have the ability of the car to control velocity. So you have velocity control um, in these. Then if you have level two, usually you have probably lane keeping or lane changing ability. So it's very much defined by the technology uh, embedded into the system. So when we look at most of them, which have level two capability in the world, we can look at a very um, prominent example, which is the Tesla. So you can see it here. There's on the bottom right here, a close up view of the dashboard. And you can see the driver is driving with 120 kilometers an hour. And the little blue light here will tell you if you're driving autonomous in level two or not. And you can see now how this change between driving level of two autonomy or driving level zero is very abrupt. So there's not much of preparation or intuitive handover. In fact, we have looked into some of these, um, these uh, fatal crashes that happened um, and included uh, some of these um, autonomous vehicles. And one of them actually happened in 2018, so two years ago now almost, where a Tesla so this is in the car in white on the right-hand side, is driving behind another vehicle. And there is some, uh, some hard barrier here made out of cement. And the road is splitting up into the right and the left-hand side. And you can see here that there's a faded lane here. And the car, the uh, Tesla is driving 
uh, in level two autonomy behind this car and eventually cannot see this lane anymore. So assumes that this is the correct lane. So you can see what is happening. The car, in fact, hit the barrier, as you can see here, um, and it comes uh, a, a crash results. So now there is a Tesla driver in this video who exactly drove on the same on the same lane, and he recorded what has happened. So you can see it, it's, it's quite bad quality, but you can actually see what has happened. So if you look onto the road, you can see that at one point, the lane here is fading and the car wants to stick to the very left lane. And that would result in a crash. And the car is aware of this somehow and wants to give back control to the driver. And if the driver doesn't react, or cannot react because the driver is not aware of the situation, that would of course result in, uh, in, in an accident. So there's also the report from the US National Transportation Safety Board available online, which actually confirms that the driver didn't have any hands on the steering wheel at certain times prior to the crash, and that a uh, transition between the higher autonomy level and the lower autonomy level was unsuccessful in this case. So we have been looking into this nice example from 1956, going back um, into the time and applying maybe this into the future, but of course, uh, with more technology available nowadays. So we have been looking into measuring behavioral and um, also physiological data, sensing data from the human, for example, measuring um, EEG data from the brain activity, but also looking into eye tracking, um, eye tracking data, and then understand if we can increase the situational awareness of a driver using a soft stiffness controllable haptic feedback seat. And I show you what that means. So I, I showed you already um, some of these um, uh, some of these accidents that are happening. So we have done a thorough literature review. This work is led by Bunny and Vari. She is a, a lecturer of intelligent mobility in the in the civil engineering department, and she has been working closely with Azade Shariati. And they have been looking into um, data from um, from this Californian. Uh, de um, uh, data set and understand that whenever there is a fault of the autonomous vehicle, more than 40% of them are of these accidents are happening in the transitional mode. So we have been now looking into can we not define the levels of autonomy based on the level of situational awareness rather than looking into the technology or not only looking into the technology and the capability of the technology of uh, autonomous vehicles, but looking also into the situational awareness. So here uh, you can see a, a model of the situational awareness that is proposed by Ensley. They also categorize these, uh, the situational awareness into perception, comprehension, and projection, so when you actually act to some event. And we have now looked into um, the brain signals, the EEG signals, and if we can um, relate um, the performance of a human to the activities, to certain brain activities. And there you can see when you measure brain activity using EEG caps, as you can see here, someone is wearing this, um, you have a lot of data. Usually you have 32 channels and these 32 channels have a not lot of noise. And so you have to do some pre-processing and usually component analysis. Maybe you have, to, you have already looked into this as part of your maths module into a principal component analysis, for instance. Then you have to extract a number of features and then do some classification. And then, of course, you have to use some data that has not been used for classification and see if your 
algorithm is working, your classification is working on this new data set as well. So my colleagues have been looking onto the brain activity, as you can see here. This has not been in a driving scenario, but more in a um, using a psychological test, which is well established, called the PEPL test. And they understood that there are certain areas of the brain that are more active than other areas when there is high situational awareness compared to low situational awareness. And then I understand that I'm coming to the end of this hour, but allow me to uh, just finish in five minutes. So we have looked also into then not only measuring behavioral and uh, physiological sensing data, but we have also looked into developing a soft stiffness controllable driver seat because level zero to level four, at least, there will be a driver in the seat. So we have looked into uh, developing a new soft robot, as you can see here, the internal um, is made of foam material and we have used here pneumatic and uh, hydraulic actuation to change between these two um, type of uh, actuation modes. And we have built an actuation system around this and then did a number of tests. And the nice thing about this actuation is that you can change and you can clearly see it in some of these experiments is that you can continuously change between the ratio of pneumatic or hydraulic actuation. And when you change between these, you can imagine pneumatic actuation is compressible, whereas hydraulic actuation is usually not compressible. So you can achieve stiffness controllable by changing the ratio between pneumatic and hydraulic actuation. So then we have looked into embedding this a simpler version, which is only pneumatically actuated into the driver seat, as you can see here. So we had a driver seat from Land Rover Jaguar. And here you can see the entire test set up during COVID time, uh, where we had to um, rely on a simplified um, driving simulator, a full integration of all the components. And here you can see the actuation on the bottom of the seat and also some other actuation at the top of the seat. And eventually we have done a number of tests. So th these are some of the um, experimental protocols that we have uh, done in order to understand the acceptance, perception, the user friendliness and other effects of this um, haptic feedback driver seats. And we have done a number of questionnaires that were asked prior to the experiments or after the experiments. And of course, we have um, carried out three different experiments. Um, the first experiment was, in fact, just um, showing participants how this haptic driver seats is working, then looking into different scenarios that have some takeover requests embedded into these experiments. Um, using audio, as you just heard, but then also using a larger number of scenarios where the participants are encouraged to take over requests, uh, to take over requests from through a haptic feedback seat. So you can see here some of the results um, and I'm very conscious of the time. Uh, you can see that the overall performance on our limited number of participants, I have to say, is um, in on average better than the published data of providing participants with visual feedback in a current BM5 series, which is published, um, where participants only have an icon that is um, changing color on the dashboard. But now we want to scale up our um, our experiments to a more advanced car driving simulator, uh, which will be is embedded in, in the lab at the moment in, at UCL. But in May, June, there will be a new lab opening, which is the Person Environment Activity Research Lab, uh, which is led by Professor Nick Tyler from the Center for Transport Studies. And you can see some, um, some uh, graphics here of the new lab facility, which is very much um, concentrating and focusing on transport engineering and the urban environment. 
Uh, if you want to follow them, of course, you can do it via Twitter. There are many more, um, many more recent imaging of the entire physical facility right now available online. And in fact, we have built um, a, with a long list of um, academics, a driving simulator. It's not the one on the left at the moment, but uh, there have been many people uh, in, in, uh, included into making this happening. So here you can see some video material of the um, virtual environment running in Unity, but also from some data. And that's where you probably come in with your uh, expertise in data analytics and artificial intelligence to process some of this data. And we have, in fact, uh, built a screen around a vehicle. And now you can drive in the vehicle and develop your own scenarios within the Unity virtual environment. So here's just some videos of how every, everything was set up. There's many things that we want to um, do within this uh, new driving simulation. And of course, if you're interested in the work that I have shown today, um, I have here a suggestions on three papers that are papers from my colleagues on, for instance, the first one on the design, fabrication and control of soft robots on stiffening in soft robotic devices and in fact modeling. And I think that some of this might be very interesting for you as many of you I can imagine are interested in artificial intelligence. I would also like to um, show or um, bring this to your attention. So this is the uh, premium conference in robotics is the international conference on robotic robots and automation, which will happen the first time ever in London in 2023. So two years from now. So whoever's in year one, I'm sure that you will be still UCL students when it comes to this. I would like to thank everyone, especially the team on the very left, top left hand side for all their work, because I'm just representing what they have achieved um, and they are working extremely hard. And of course, I would also like to um, thank my internal collaborators and external collaborators and the funding agencies that provided uh, funding for us to do this type of research. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'm very happy. I'm sorry I run a little bit over, but I give you, I'm happy to stay on uh, for 10, 15 minutes to answer all of your questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Hel Helger, for the brilliant speech. Um, now we will have a Q&A session. Feel free to type in the chat or raise your hands if you have any questions. But um, first of all, let me start off with the questions that some of our audience have sent through the registration form. Um, what are the main challenges soft robotics faces in its medical application? Uh, that's a very, very good question. And um, I like the approach that you have taken here for everyone to fill in some um, a form and to make them ask questions because you can see it's very difficult in a, um, in a virtual setting that people ask questions. But I can only encourage everyone to please unmute and um, ask some questions. There are no wrong and right answers. They are all valid. Um, uh, and coming to your question, in fact, um, soft robots have have or have many advantages uh, because they're made out of soft materials and they're inherent considered as inherently safe but of course there are many challenges and this these challenges are not only challenges in the medical field but also in the medical field and this starts from fabrication so you know that if you develop or those of you who do mechanical engineering have been working with computer-aided design software tools where you are designing a 3D model of your device that you want to build. And then you just save it as a STL file usually and send it to the printing company. And then you will have your designed piece. In soft robotics, this is not possible. There are printers that can print soft materials, but these are usually not very elastic and durable. So we have to do a casting kind of way. 
So the manufacturing side is very challenging. And on the other side, modeling as well. So when you come to models, again, when you have rigid robots, you can use geometry to derive your forward kinematics or your inverse kinematics. And usually that is valid, even for very high loads. You saw that when you have a soft robot, this is not valid always. So you have to use different model um, approaches. And some of them might have numerical or analytical um, uh, techniques that are combined with artificial intelligence, neural networks, to uh, name one of them, to then, um, to then make a model uh, more accurate if needed. And of course, there are then in the medical field also certification challenges. You have to be biocompatible, etc. So I think uh, there's another question here that uh, can act as a follow-up question. Um, regarding the uh, scale of technology used uh, in soft robotics and AI, what are the opportunities in low resource countries? Um, for are this specific for soft robotics or in general? Uh, yeah, soft robotics and AI, yeah. Um, soft robotics for, so for, for that's a very challenging uh, question. So in, in terms of um, AI technology, of course, um, nowadays we live in a world where everyone has a mobile phone. So you can imagine if everyone has a mobile phone, these are not mobile phones from 10 years ago, where you had your, I don't know if you still know the Nokia 3333 or something like this, you know, the which had a black white display but nowadays everyone has a smartphone so that's essentially a, um, a device a computer so if you develop some programs based on artificial intelligence there are loads of people um, that actually can use your um, technology that you develop them based on ai because they have a mobile phone um, so I think that was that through, of course, the smartphones and that everyone has it, even in low mid income countries, app technology that people develop can be, in fact, uh, be used by even people in low and mid income countries. And in fact, in some of the cases, I've also seen that people have developed um, single-use medical devices that you can actually um, combine with your mobile phone device and um, and use the mobile phone device as a computer to then, um, for example, look at something if you have an endoscope or so on. So um, I think there are many possibilities. And in terms of soft robotics, I think um, the costs of manufacturing soft devices is reasonably is it can be low cost so we could make um, devices that are based on on soft materials that could be then used probably then as a single use items because it's uh, challenging to for the medical purposes for instance to disinfect uh, maybe we have also durability issues but uh, i can imagine that due to the lower price in, in manufacturing this could be possible I see. Um, here's another interesting question. Uh, considering how uh, the AI and engineering field is rapidly advancing, um, can undergraduates from a non-mathematical or engineering degree enter the robotics and AI field? Um, of course. Um, if you have the motivation, you can essentially do a lot of things, right? I think that of course if you or that's my opinion if you if you if you do a mechanical engineering degree i i guess that you would need to um improve or first of all learn and then improve your programming skills because of course ai has is is not robotics ai is data i, I would more argue a data science or mathematical tool so you have to uh, a little bit more go deeper into mathematics and also um, data science and programming, of course. 
Um, but I think that is um, absolutely possible, of course. Um, on the other side, um, going into robotics is always possible from an engineering perspective, because um, as I mentioned there, it's a multidisciplinary field where mechanical engineering are coming together with electronic or electrical engineering and computer science. And there are so many different aspects in robotics um, including AI and robotics that uh, can be covered. And of course, um, it doesn't mean that you have to be a graduate student to go and do some work in there. You can um, start from the first year if, you, if the time allows, of course. Um, I would encourage you to try something, to try small projects and see what you're interested in. It does, robotics in itself has so many different areas. Um, from sensing for robotics, AI for robotics, um, human robot interaction, human machine interaction, human computer interaction. You know, there are so many aspects, image processing, etc., that it is very good to try all of these and find your way. I have also a question here that is directed to me directly. From um, so, how difficult uh, was it to develop medical devices, given that your background is in mechanical engineering? Any advice for students who may want to try to get into medical hardware development? Um, in the end, I think it was not so difficult. I have to say, anyone, when, when we develop certain things, we develop it for an application. And so if you develop an app, you also don't develop it for engineers as a mechanical engineer or as a computer science. You develop it for a, usually for a user that has any background, you know? Um, so when we develop certain things for uh, clinicians, of course, we develop it for clinicians, but we are still engineers in the broader aspect. So we have to kind of understand how they operate the same way you have to understand if you develop an app for everyone, what do people want who go to the gym, for instance, right? So you have to cross your border of engineering a little bit, go into their discipline and understand them. And most of the times you need an expert, not only one expert, probably many experts. So if you want to do an app for, uh, for, uh, for some people who go to the gym, I wouldn't ask one person who goes to the gym, what do you think about this? Um, but you have to have a variety of opinions of experts, of course, um, so that you can understand how they are thinking and what they want. And then on the other side, if we have uh, people like clinicians, we also have to understand what clinicians want, what, is, what are their requirements, it's called use the, the user needs, right? So you have the user needs that you have to identify. And of course, it helps to understand a little bit of the anatomy of the human, you know, of the, you know how big should be a hole when you do a little incision. What, what does biocompatibility mean? So you have to read a little bit, but it doesn't matter which application you do. If you do it for an autonomous vehicle or for, a, for medicine, you have to kind of cross your boundary, go a little bit out of your comfort zone and also understand the perspective of the people who you design it for. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree. Um, Professor Haug, is there time for another question? Yes. Okay, uh, we have one last question by Dan. Hi Dan, thank you very much for the talk. That was a really nice insight. Um, I just had two sort of quick questions. Uh, the first one is to do with uh, the mini minimally invasive um, surgery robots you're, you're building. Are yeah. you, when you're developing these, are you doing it with the intention of of, of replanning the sort of the process of the operation, or is it redesigning a robot to essentially do the same operation and follow the same steps but better? And then, secondly, sort of leading on from the last one, could you kind of describe how you interact? With, with clinicians uh, and engage with experts in different fields? Do you have people come on board with you or do you just briefly um, uh, engage with them? Yeah, so coming to your first question, it is to show the, that, you know, there's, there's certain challenges from the clinician 
for instance, that the clinician has to work with tools crossover. And sometimes in some applications, the surgeon cannot see a certain area um, in detail. So we are proposing a system that it can do essentially the same thing in a much better way. To your second question, um, it helps to read um, scientific papers about certain procedure. And in these scientific papers, at the end, there's usually a section describing the challenges, or there are even papers out that describe in general the challenges. Or there are papers that describe, so for example, with the autonomy, there are papers describing why car accidents are happening with autonomous vehicles. So then you have to understand why are they happening. You have to really do a statistical analysis. What are the what are the problems there? And then it always helps to contact um, clinicians. And these clinicians should usually be interested in research. Some of them are. You have to imagine, so me as an academic, my full-time, not full-time, but partially my, my job is to do research, right? I'm interested in research. I'm happy to do this. But when we talk about clinicians, Broadly speaking, clinicians are there to do 100% work in the hospital and save people's lives. So whatever they do in terms of research, most of them, not all of them, they do it in their free time. So that has to be appreciated also from the engineering side. So you have to make maybe the effort to meet them at their time that they are available, which can be at six, seven o'clock, and really listen to them, you know, and not impose your solution onto them, you know, I have this idea of the soft robot. Where can I find a clinician who supports me? But to really listen to the clinician and understanding the problem and propose a solution in collaboration with them. And I think that's, the, th that's when you have a clinician actively on board because they see, oh, this person, first of all, understands the problem, listens to me. Um, and I, I, the clinician thinks that the solution will be actually good and applicable and uh, and and do the job uh, yeah okay, thank you very much thank you for your question uh, next up we have jamie um professor help would you like to answer his question yes of course hello so sorry for going against the last question there um i thank you for your talk again it was uh, very very interesting I've just got Thank one you. quick question regarding your haptic feedback um, in the autonomous cars. So I was just wondering if this is intended to be something that's like a direct replacement to the, um, to the icon that's on the screen and to the sound that comes over when you need to transfer, or perhaps is this something that could become a more continuous feedback system? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't, so, so on the haptic feedback side, I believe that... Um, Driving is very visual. Um, so you have to monitor the environment very carefully. And I strongly believe that anything on the dashboard is secondary because you otherwise have to also monitor, the, monitor um, your dashboard continuously. So I really think it's a suboptimal way of giving feedback. And that's why I'm investigating this. I would argue in a short term, that this haptic feedback seat could be complementary. So work together with this visual feedback. If it will replace it, that's also down to regulations and how effective haptic feedback can be. At the moment, we cannot really make definite conclusions. This is very much in the research stage, but I hope that in the next three years, we will have a more definite answer of how effective this is and if there is capability of replacing visual feedback. Thank you again so much for your answer and for your time. Thank you very much for the question. I'm yeah. very happy when people have questions. Okay, um, that is the end of our Q&A session and our talk as a whole. Um, on behalf of everyone present today, I believe I can say that it has been a very eye-opening and meaningful speech. So thank you once again to Professor Helk for taking your time out to talk to us. 
And um, thank you very much for the invitation again and very engaging audience, which yeah. I very much like. And um, I hope everyone will have a nice weekend and also take some time off. Um, I understand everyone is sitting at home and is reminded continuously of doing some work. So please take, close your laptop sometimes and go for a walk or engage with your friends through uh, maybe other channels you cannot meet, but I hope you have a good weekend. Have a good weekend too. Um, last but not least, uh, we have Martinez to introduce to us a very exciting series that he will be leading. Uh, yeah. Professor Haug, you are, you are free to leave if you want to. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you so much. Okay. So, first of all, I would like to thank you all for gathering for this speech. And so, as some of you may know, the UCL AI Society is going to organize new tutorial series in November. And I have a quick update related to that. So, on Monday, we are going to release the first batch of asynchronous material. And in addition to that, we are also going to release a video, which is going to be uploaded into Society's YouTube channel, in which I'm going to overview the, like, the whole series, the whole syllabus, and stuff like that. So stay up to that. Yeah. Um, so there you have it. Follow us on our social media channels for more exciting updates and details, such as the tutorial series by Martinas. Thank you, everyone, for attending. <laughs>